welcome to the Earthworks Podcast, where our team will share the jargon of carbon from many of our turf friends from the past 30 years. Hello all and welcome to the Earthworks Podcast. I'm your host, Jack Higgins, and I have the pleasure to be sitting across the desk from Mr. Tim Zeribita, uh, the golf course superintendent at Bellwood Country Club. Tim, thank you for having me here and hosting me in the clubhouse. Well, I appreciate you coming on by. It's always nice having you come toward the property, and I appreciate the opportunity to be on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, this is going to be fun, and because we have a lot to talk about, uh, because you know, you're very passionate about what you do here. And, uh, and it really comes across in working with you. And, uh, you know, you've got a lot of interesting thoughts and I'm kind of eager to, uh, to get them out there. Mm-hmm. So let's, uh, let's give the listener, just set the scene here a little bit, tell them a little bit about Bellwood. We're here in uh, Pottstown, Pennsylvania. That is correct. Right on the banks of the Schuylkill River, the mighty Schuylkill that runs, we're north of Philly a little bit. This this river runs right down into Philadelphia and, and outlets into the Delaware. And mm-hmm. uh, so this is kind of like a greater Philly area. But you toured me around the club just a, just a minute ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, we got to kind of take in a lot. And one of the first things you pointed out to me was like, Jack, look out on the horizon there. You see that tree over the hill? Look up. And, uh, and I'll let you tell us what you got going on. So we call that tree the perch tree. Um, I've only been here a little bit more than a year, but we have had a nesting pair of bald eagles for at least 10 years that have had successful, I don't even know what you call it, I would say litters or uh, mm-hmm. made it successfully all of those years. So the first thing you got to see were mama and daddy bald eagle yes. on the bald perch tree. And just to the right of that, we have a nest, a large nest with three eaglets in it right now that are just about spreading their wings. They'll be hopping out of the nest probably within the next couple of days here, jumping from branch to branch before mom and dad kick them out completely. And yeah, then, yeah, they were like, yeah, they were flapping, like kind of like practicing, testing. Correct. And that has just started within the last couple of days. So it's always fun. I shouldn't say always fun because I haven't been there that long, but when the eagles came back in the fall, last year to check out the conditions and to check out the nest it was almost like kids coming home from college i was so excited to see them and then when you see mommy sitting on the net or sitting on the nest i assume it's the mom um we knew we had eggs in there and yeah a few weeks back maybe a month ago we got to just see the little heads popping on up and they're almost already full size so it's it's just wonderful coming in here every single morning seeing the progression and it's like national geographic every single day out here every day and i'm sure everybody at the club gets that like kind of excitement out of it all the golfers everybody Uh, without question we are definitely known well hopefully for the quality of the golf course and the eagles itself probably the eagles a little bit more but uh yeah it's just it's I, I can't tell you how much fun it is coming and seeing the activity in the morning. Yeah, yeah. So we'll get into golf, but I mean, now these these eggs. When were the eggs laid? And you said you said you, the the adults came back in the fall. When do you think they do the work and lay the eggs? So they come back in the fall, and then they so basically after the eaglets mature, they all find greener pastures elsewhere. Or all experiment. Right. So we don't see them for a good couple of months. Um, yeah, but I don't re- I don't recall exactly when it was, but probably October of last year is when I got to see one of the eagles return, and then they would come back for a couple of days, head on out, do some more experimenting, and then uh, yeah, and I guess it would be sometime late January, early February is when they were both here all the time. So you would see either the mom or the dad sitting on the eggs. From what I've learned, I think they take turns doing that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and then. Every morning now, especially that the eaglets have hatched, um, they're fishing in our pond on the seventh hole and they'll come up with a carp or they're grabbing bedding for the eaglets. Like um, just before you came here today, one of the eagles was in a fescue grabbing a huge clump of, you know, the freshly cut, right? The freshly cut fine fescue that we just trimmed up last week, oh, and take it back on up. And oh, that's so cool! Yeah, what's just the activity in the mornings? That's when they're most active. Uh, when I'm out here, it's just it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Now you've like this is a beautiful place for uh, for eagles to live. Uh, you know, we mentioned it's on the Schuylkill. You said you got your irrigation pond here. I mean. But let's set the scene a little bit more. You've got this beautiful link style golf course uh, that you you can see vistas and see across. Like uh, I imagine, if there's some if there's some prey running down the side of the fairway, that eagle's seeing it. You yeah, know? With, it, without a doubt. So you get to see um, 
you know, occasionally, like I say, National Geographic, you get to see them hunting and grabbing the spoils and bringing them back up to the nest. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's outstanding. So um, Bellwood is is quite a golfer's club, as you've always described it to me. There, you you know, uh, you don't do crazy amounts of rounds. It's uh, the the place is kept really nice for the golf for for the golfing membership. So that's correct. Um, Bellwood right now we have two hundred and sixty golf members. Mm-hmm. So it's a low. I don't want to say low usage club. That's not a proper description. It is a golfer's club. We do not have tee times here at Bellwood, so it's wow. old-fashioned the way, you know, if I were a member, the way I like it. Mm-hmm. So you show up. Once your foursome is here, foursome or threesome, you get in line and get on the first tee. Oh, well, wow. you know, there's other clubs that I'm familiar with. Uh, you know, you have four tees, reservation systems. It really helps the staff of the club, but that's what we sort of sell here is we don't want it to be tee times. Just show up and play. So oh, that's we. Cool. Have been doing more rounds during the COVID times, but we were up to you know fourteen, fifteen thousand rounds a year. Right. Historically, right. they do around twelve. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a very nice place from a member's perspective. It's not too busy. Mm-hmm. And you do have you do have family sort of things here as well. There is a pool, but like there's sort of the golf course is the golf course's thing mm-hmm. and and the the pool is the pool's thing. So I got to correct you on that. We do not have a pool. We have an aquatics facility. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah. Got so it. we actually have four different water features. Um, that was built about 10 years ago. The club was really struggling financially financially mm-hmm. and they took a flyer. I think it cost 10 million dollars to build wow. that time back, but from what I understand, it's really helped save the club after the stock market crash in 2008, they were really struggling. And right now we've got, I believe there's about a 70-person 70, 70 waiting list for the golf course, and I think it's about 100 families for the pool. So uh, it's tough to get in. We have people that are really dying to get into the place. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. that's wonderful. So let, let's learn a little bit more about you because you've had quite a, a career in the golf business and in the greenkeeping business, uh, and this is not your first stop. Um, I just learned a couple minutes ago that you actually got into golf um, as a golf professional. So I am a golfer. I've always been an avid golfer. I still am to this day. You're a member at Huntington Valley. I am a member at Huntington Valley. And we'll, and we'll get to talk about some some Huntington stories and, and that as well. Okay. But okay. But, uh, but but yes. So tell tell me more. How you got into golf? So my buddy, I can't remember what grade I was in. I think it was sixth or seventh grade. I was about twelve years old. Right. He said, uh, Tim. Let's head on down to Melrose Country Club. I know the caddy master down there. So I went down that first day. I'll never forget it. I came back with like 12 or 13 bucks after training. And my mother drove me down there every single morning, every single weekend morning. I couldn't stand it. I hated the people. I hated waking up early. I hated the activity of the work. But all that changed because they let caddies play on Monday. So one Monday I went out. I made what I thought was a birdie. Um, on the 16th hole, I made a four. I later learned that was a par four. Okay. <laughs> so I actually went <laughs> But it up. was exciting regardless. So I parred the hole, yeah. But that's when it started. And that when, um, after getting bit by the golf bug, mm-hmm. I wound up working in the golf shop there uh, throughout high school, throughout college, played a little bit of collegiate golf. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's funny how I wound up in the turf business. So Well, where did you go to college? I'm a Penn State grad. Okay, State, got it. Penn State Turf Grass Science. Oh yeah, wow. excellent. And and you played you played out there in college? I played for a satellite campus for okay. Penn State got one it. time. Uh, or for a couple seasons. Yes. So but, was, but but keep going, tell your story. I wasn't the best student in high school. I know it's gonna be hard to believe. Um, and the way to get up to or the way actually to get into Penn State and get up to main campus was to apply to the College of Agriculture. I heard, hey, they'll take anybody, and that certainly fit my description. I think it worked for me too, yeah. dude. <laughs> so my whole plan was to transfer into the PGM program and become a golf professional. Right. So um, I got up to Penn State, uh, made it through the first year of turf up there. I did an internship at a golf course I had never even heard of before. It was in Philadelphia, not too far from home, but a place called Aronimate Golf Club. (laughs) So you could say, how, Tim, you're an avid golfer and you never heard of the place. It just, this was, this was before the internet. So there weren't any rankings or anything at all like that. I showed up on property there. Talk about thinking everything's a par five. I came from Melrose, which was 6,000 yards long. Um, Yeah. The first hole, I 
touring it with the superintendent. I said, oh, obviously a par five. Now it's par four, Tim. Second hole I thought was a par five, par four. So it's diff much different scale than I had ever seen. I, re I It's so funny you say that. I remember having very similar experience and then learning to teach myself, like, just keep your mouth shut because, like, where you used to play when you were in the seventh grade, mm -hmm. it, this isn't the same thing. No, yeah. no. So, uh it didn't take long for me to fall in love with the agronomic side of the game. Okay. So I was there. I worked under TJ LaPlante was a superintendent when I started, and TJ came from the Augusta tree. Wow. And yeah. Talk about old-fashioned. We did everything by hand. So you weren't trailing, trailering the greens mowers out. Yes. You would walk them on out. Yes. Put the wheels on Put the wheels and on walk. Tray. Yep, yep. So I probably lost about 40 pounds in the, in the first month over there, but just wound up loving it. Uh, I'm an early riser, always have been. Okay. And just the conditions we were able to present, I was never involved with anything like that. And mm -hmm. it just, it, the talons got me talking about the Eagles. And uh, yeah, 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 they just, I, I, you know, ever since then, it's been, uh, it's been where I've been. Now, did your, like your professional career, your, 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 your golfing career, was that parallel to, to this? Or did the, the golfing kind of stop, or at least the ambition of being a golf course professional, did that kind of stop and you continued as a super? Or how did that so go? I spent three years at Aronimic. I was, um, you know, promoted to assistant superintendent. I did an internship there. And mm -hmm. halfway through the internship, I was promoted to second assistant superintendent. Um, and became the assistant after I graduated school. Uh, so I worked under two different superintendents, TJ. He got let go halfway through my second season, and I worked under Rick Holanda. Um, the second half of my career at Aronimic was not as fun as the first half. Okay. And I had an opportunity. My father got very ill at that time, and he was hospitalized, and I was really struggling to go back and see him. Mm -hmm. And I had an opportunity to go back to the club where I caddied at and worked in the golf shop as, a golf, as a golf professional. So after I left Aronimic, um, they did not want me to leave. I can promise you that. <laughs> the actually, Greens Committee took me out to try to get me to stay. Wow. Very cool. But man. I decided to become a, an assistant pro at Melrose and spent three years doing that before I realized that I did not like working in the evenings. Mm -hmm. I really preferred the mornings, and the schedule just didn't work for me. Yeah, you said you're early riser. Correct. Correct. So that schedule was horrible. I used to work from like 11 in the, 11 in the morning to like eight at night. And then oh. the next day you'd be in at seven, you'd work seven to two. It just, you were all over the place and being 22, 23, it doesn't work. It does not with uh, my party and lifestyle at that time. No. <laughs> there <laughs> so you go. The early mornings did not work for me then. <laughs> Uh, well, so you, you made a change. You got back into the agronomy side I, of things. I did, and that's going to bring us to Huntington Valley. So I oh. lived right by Huntington Valley Country Club. I knew it well because I played it a bunch growing up uh, with friends. And I just saw Scott Anderson, who is still the superintendent there to this day. Yes, he is. Had a sign on Turwood Road. It said, help want it with a number. I called him up, told him my story, told him I used to be assistant at Aronomy and you know hired me on the spot. So I worked there for a few months before... Um, finding a job with a municipality where I worked for 16 years as a bunch of different titles. I was a landscape manager, golf course superintendent, um, foreman, which basically means I was running the parks maintenance department. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. and Well, let's not skip over the Huntington Valley bit because I think that that is where I've heard you mention that you really learned a lot of like the soils approach and the like agronomy from that end. I mean, Scott's kind of a legend in that regard. Correct. So when I was there for that brief time, I really, that, that, my philosophy was not formed then. It was more when I went to work for Abington Township. Okay. Which is right down the road from Scott. Mm -hmm. but now I'm making my own agronomic, my own agronomic programs, which mm -hmm. I really did not have that much knowledge of. So me and Scott, Scott was sort of like my mentor. Mm -hmm. And I bought in, bought in 100% with what he does. I mean, the playability of Huntington Valley, soils first, keeping it dry, promoting bent grass. That's uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where that philosophy was born, really, when I started making my own programs and presenting a golf course myself. Yeah. Now, tell me about, like, the, the sort of stuff that you had to do when you worked at H H Abington Township. You said you had a nine-hole nine golf facility, but you, but you took care of other stuff as well. Correct. So we had, it was more than 50 properties, I think 55 properties Jeez. on 600 acres located throughout the township. So we were always trailering things from our shop to other places, but our shop was located in our flagship park, which was Alvathorpe Park, where I had a, 
little par three chip and putt golf course. Mm-hmm. But we had that maintained as well. I don't. I would have put the turf conditions out there up against anywhere in the Philadelphia section. We we're very proud of it. Was it old? Was it old Poa p- push up greens or? So or? They, I, I probably took over a property with about fifty percent coverage on the greens, and wow. yeah, we were able to get that not only to one hundred percent, but. When I left, we were probably about 85, 90% bent grass. Yes. So I learned tricks to promote bent grass, verticutting, mm-hmm. stuff like that. And Seed in a bunch of good bents. Correct, so. correct. And do and do the work, uh, you know, from the soils up and 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 water in the way that bent likes to thrive and, and that sort of so thing. Absolutely. We just, I mean, it, those were old soil push-up greens. Now we, during my time there, we did build up, you know, a four-inch sand layer. Sure. But we did everything by hand. We pulled hose. I shouldn't say we. I pulled hose. There was only a little bit over an acre of greens. Acre so of greens. We and being that it was all part three, is all very close. Correct. Like not a lot of drive time. As I told you, I could, from the moment we were filling up the sprayer to the moment I was cleaning it out, could be, you know, if things go well, like 45 minutes. So. Oh, my gosh. So how many guys are listening right now thinking that's a dream? Oh, you know? It was awesome because you're watching the radar. You know, you have a rain coming in. Well, guess what? I'm going to put the wetting agent out. I'm going to put the soil feed mix out. And, yeah. I, I can do it. Yeah. yeah. I'll, get, I'll get it done. Yeah. It was a, I mean, wonderful place to learn. And I made mistakes. I definitely killed grass. But uh, doing everything yourself, uh, like I said, just a, a great place to learn. Oh, that's really cool, man. Yeah. So, um, and, and you spent a lot of time there. And, and 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 you learned a lot. And you learned a lot. Without question. Without and you have question. a pension to show for it. So I did. There was a change in management, um, you know, and I was in line for a position. Everybody knew that that was going to be my position. And right. And I won't go through the whole story, but change in management. They released the budget for 2019 and late 2018, and mm-hmm. I saw my boss was retiring. I saw that his position had been eliminated. So I gave it a try. I, I had sort of plateaued where I was mm-hmm. and wasn't happy with the direction things were going. Um in the spring, there was a couple of things I wanted to get done. I was not able to get done. So I started going to uh, people who I respected in the business, Scott Anderson being one of them. So what do you guys think about me getting back into what I'm passionate about, golf full time? You know, at that time, I was a certified playground safety, safety inspector. Yes. A certified pool operator, which I still am now because I'm here at Bellwood running the aquatics facility here. Oh, wow. Yes, yes. But um, no, I got back into golf and I decided to just, again, my pension was there. I did some research about if my pension would still be there. And it's that may have ruffled the feathers of the hires up a little bit. And we had a meeting and I just said, this is not what I'm doing for the rest of my life. I did not want to be miserable for the second half of my career. And I decided to make a move. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you are a passionate golfer and you were, and you live and work and grew up in this kind of in a golf Mecca here outside of Philadelphia. There's some wonderful classic golf courses here and uh and and you know them so you were able to get back into this into this kind of classic golf yes, sort of yes. space so i believe you had some time at lehigh country Club, yes, isn't I that did. right so you talk yeah. about fantastic golf courses i still call that the philadelphia section lehigh uh, oh it is it is and it's a flynn which it is. so so which flynn i think has a number or, or rather a, a lot of uh, the majority of his work is in the southeast pennsylvania area is that right i don't think it's the majority but there's a lot of okay. very good flynn golf courses manufacturers philadelphia country club um huntington huntington valley yeah without <laughs> without question so huntington valley is very high up on that list but uh Lehigh also should be there. If you put Lehigh where Philly country was, it would be top 100, no question. Yeah, very good point. Uh, it's, yeah. a, it's a great place. John's been on the podcast, actually. Oh, you, has he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very so. good. Um, yeah, so so let's let's see. A little bit more about um, about Bellwood here. Uh, you've got you, – you, you said something to me earlier that I found really kind of cool – Um, Just as a superintendent, something, a a morning job that you like to do is cut cleanups. Correct. It gets you on every green. Get get your feet on every single green. If you have anything that's going to jump out at you, you're going to see it. I'm Mm going to be on every single putting surface. You're going to tour the whole property. Plus, uh, you know, I get the steps in also. I try and keep as active as possible. Sitting on a sprayer, you know, burn the calories as you do is when you're... Be- walking behind him hour. Oh yeah, no doubt. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which is fun. Get the get the steps in, burn the calories, and and also being the golfer, you're able to kind of see exactly maybe where where the green has shrunk in certain areas, and you're able to kind of set the new line. 
so that's without question again. Um, yeah, so when conditions allow, last fall, early last spring, um, we eat into the collars or the approaches a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, all the greens have sort of shrunk and gotten circular. And you see it all the time. The fairways out here, we've probably lost areas that are, whether there used to be a courtesy cut or a step cut, you've lost five or six feet, I'm sure, on some of the fairways. You can see the bent grass in the rough. Um, but yeah, green's the same thing. They all tend to get smaller. Your operators do not want to scalp in. Or yeah, I don't want to be the guy that scalps. Correct. So I've got a couple new guys out here this year that are mowing fairways. And mm -hmm. I said, guys, do not be timid. After the first couple cuts and you see six inches away from the edge of the rough, I said, guys, you got to cut into it. So we've got them. I've, I've actually got them going a little bit the other way. They're getting a little bit too aggressive. So we're backing them off okay. pretty soon after today. That was what I noticed as we were driving around out there. I actually saw it too. Okay, okay. But that was believe it or not by design because I want I don't want the guys to be afraid to get right up. To that's that right. Edge. Yeah. That's right. Well, let also let's talk about that. It's it's the first week of May and it's still been we've had like two weeks of forty degree nights, forty five degree nights. It's yeah. it's been cold. We've had a little bit of frost, but before that, it really warmed up. So. The first Scythia popped very early this year. I mean, we had some days where it approached 90, and they mm -hmm. were consecutive days. So soil temperatures really warmed up. The bent grass perked up and woke and woke up a little bit, and we're sort of in like a little holding pattern right now. It's like everything's in the refrigerator. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Which is cool. It's not bad. I, I mean, it's better that your bent woke up because you have great color. You were able to aerify and get good recovery. Yes. Now, you mentioned that you solid time everything in the spring. We did. We were planning on this past week. We have our aerification time scheduled. Um, the good Lord was look at, looked upon us kindly again. We had perfect weather. Mm -hmm. But in early February, I think it was um, Valentine's Day. There was, again, it was... It was, was hot. It was, it was like 60, 70 degrees. Uh, uh, it, I remember speaking of Lehigh, uh, John Chassard posted, like, the first time I've ever mowed fairways on Valentine's yeah. Day. Yeah, so we took that opportunity. I looked at the forecast, um, called our outside contractor, see if he had availability. And he said, yeah, we'll come on out. So we did the deep tine uh, earlier than we expected, but it was great. I mean, you can see in all those holes the roots that are growing down into those holes, and, yeah, we really... Knocked that one out of the park, I think, too, with the timing. Yeah, yeah. And then and then the solid, then the, the three, three eighths or, or half inch, five? Yeah, like half inch solid tine is yeah. what we did uh, nine days ago, I guess it was. And you were healed up. Yeah. Well, we also had the benefit of three and a half inches of rain this past weekend. Uh, mm. Now, anybody in the Philadelphia section knows about team matches, so I felt bad for our competitors on Sunday that were out there playing. Mm -hmm. The majority of the clubs in Philadelphia did not play those matches. We are sand-based greens, California-style sand-based greens, but the good thing from our perspective is it washed all, that, all the sand that we put out there in, and we mowed them for the first time yesterday, and... Yeah, the the reels are perfect. We didn't need it. We did not pick up any sand at all. I saw I saw your mechanic down there. He yeah. didn't seem grumpy. He was happy. He, he was a happy guy. So yeah, we top dressed first before we solitined, and we um, doubled up the solitines. So I don't know if you called an arm or a head or whatever. But we had ten solitines per head. Top dressed first, and it was amazing how much of the sand got pounded down initially. Yeah, so we did that. Drug it on in, and then like I said, Mother Nature was on our side, and really washed everything in this weekend and we're just we're ready to be shot out of the cannon out there you mentioned that this is the only time of year also that your greens see a granular fertilizer and that's the only you only use granular twice a year twice a year i know a lot of my peers have gotten away from that mm -hmm. that's like a, that's another task that i want to do myself to make sure that we don't have any striping there you go but yeah i'd like giving them a little shot and then supplementing spoon feeding uh, with liquids throughout the season. Yeah, but a foundational shot. You use the 1025, the Earthworks 1025. You said That's correct. Get you, it has some ammonium sulfate, so you get a. It's a great spring product for like this cool kind of wet springs. Jack, I've been using that product for 20 years, and if wow. it, if it ain't broke, don't break it. There you go. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Done. Yeah, absolutely. No, but I uh, I rely on it. Um, Going back to when I was at Alvathorpe, the par three greens, it was a lighted golf course. Uh, so people were out there at night too. Oh my so gosh. the traffic on these small greens, um, they had fall offs and everything. We used a lot more granular. So I was up probably around four pounds of nitrogen through granular products throughout the season, but we had to keep them had to keep them going with the traffic. You know, I did, that that brings up an interesting point. I've never really kind of considered that or gotten a chance to talk to anyone that managed a par three golf course at a high level, but 
they must take an enormous amount of foot traffic. Yeah, absolutely. We didn't have to deal with car traffic, which was a good thing. Right, but, uh, but the greens, I mean, fast, like just just nonstop foot traffic. And the cupping areas were incredibly small. So the third green is a perfect example. There's only a couple hundred square feet where you could put a cup. Mm -hmm. So all the traffic is in one, is in one area. Mm -hmm. So. So hence, like, um, th that why bent grass was the better choice. Like, the more you could encourage more bent onto those greens, the better things got, I'm sure. Well, I, I was actively, you know, just for myself, trying to get as much bent in there as possible. Uh, I don't want to say it's a superior surface. Me as a golfer, if I get onto a stand of bent poa, mm -hmm. then I feel like I'm at home. I feel like it's the grass that I grew up on. Yeah, I uh, agree. So I love it. But I agree. I wanted to see, you know, the tactics that I would use to promote bent grass. So it's a big... Again, I, um, we had groomers on the ham hours there, so when we know the bent was out competing the POA in the summertime and you're going to have a couple cloudy days, that's when I would groom. Uh, you know you have a rain coming on in. Groom then. And it's amazing how you were able to um, promote the bent grass populations. Mm -hmm. That also with, you know, liquid fertilizer when the bent is out competing the POA. Mm -hmm. you know, the other thing about the grooming from from your background for that I remember learning from Scott was the grooming in the summertime was that um, when it's dry, you don't want the plant to be so large that each each root system has to support like a nine inch plant, you know. So there is a theory. I know his theory. He talks exactly. about this, right? Does. There's a directly proportional relationship between the length of your shoots and the length of your roots. Right. You do the majority of your rooting in the spring. Mm -hmm. and I would say some would say the fall and the winter, but the majority of the rooting happens in the spring. Yes. If you're able to promote green, keep the leaf blade a little bit longer, in theory, the, roots, the root structure is going to be a little bit longer. And then if you take out that leaf blade in the summertime, um, remove some of that, now you've got a... A bigger root system that's not supporting as much of a shoot. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, good. So you were keyed in on that, too. That is the theory. I've heard about that a lot over the years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I should say that is his theory. <laughs> that's right. But that's I, right. I'm a believer in it, too. Yeah, yeah. You can see it work. Now, you've got a 100% bent grass golf course here. Pretty close. Pretty close. There's a little bit of power on the greens. Uh, they, they've... There were some struggles, from what I understand, over the years. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to inherit a golf course where the fine turf was in spectacular shape. Really? But yeah. previous years, I think they had some issues on the greens. They were just trying to get anything to germinate. So mm -hmm. there's a couple greens that have some POA in them. Um, I don't think the membership notices. I could see it. But it I, is this a candidate for something aggressive, like a POA cure? I've or? thought about that. Mm -hmm. I've uh, asked I've asked my consultant about that. Mm -hmm. I was shot down very quickly because he had, he knows the history of the place. And he said, Tim, whatever you did last year on these greens, you're not changing. So there you go. Just keep it up. We were very successful. Would it be? Yeah, possibly Poa Cure. Um, but there's a couple greens where there are areas that are predominantly Poa. It's not much. The fairways are, or have been on a Paclobutrazole program mm -hmm. um, for as long as I know. So they are pretty much 100% clean. And tees are a little... That's not a Heinz 57, mostly bent. Um, the par 3 tees here are very undersized for the amount of play that we get. They're very undersized for a par 3 tee. So um, we've been putting chewing's fescue in there to, and even ryegrass when I started because there just was, you know, they were divided to heck over winter. Right. So just get something in there. Do do you fully close down or, or is it open all winter? No, we stay open all winter. Right. So, but the right. club closes for the month of January, but the membership is still allowed to come out and carry their own bag after 12 o'clock. Yeah, so so on a winter like this, you could have gotten pretty beat up. Yeah, yeah. Now, we do, I, I change a couple things. Um, we put the tee markers in the rough. So okay, the good threes, move. Yeah, yeah. So the, we're, it's actually, once we stop at posting for um, handicapping purposes, which was in November, we put the T markers, especially on the par threes in the rough. By mm -hmm. that time, the bent grass really has shut down. You're not going to get much recovery. And we just sold that as we want to be in the best possible spot at the start of 2023 that we could be in. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's talk about last year. You said this was your this is your this was your first season. This first past season at Bellwood, and it happened to be 
the worst drought we've had in 30 plus years. This may have been the epicenter for that also because we got absolutely nothing. Now the dates, I work just about every day. I get the dates confused, but okay. I think for June, July, and August, I don't know if we had a rain event. I think it was mid-June we may have had something. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But then I was... So you think a good 10 to 12 weeks, zero rain? Without question. And Oh my gosh. You know, south of here places got hammered but we were just at that spot where we didn't get anything it was very spotty um it, you know i i don't live far from here nine seventy miles from here and i do i watched a couple different times where rain went around me mm -hmm. but you know but there was plenty of places that were just not getting anything yeah we were in one of those places so and again a bunch of a bunch of the other courses that are in this area experience the same thing right Huntington Valley, which is on the eastern part of Montgomery County. Same we're, thing. And we're west, no we're west of there a good bit. Correct, but. correct. We're like 40 minutes, I think, mileage-wise, about 20 miles west of it. So it's very dry in this section. This kind of latitude. Yeah. So um, let's talk about last year. I mean, what did you see? What did you learn? What were you surprised about? I was surprised at how well everything held up last year. Now, coming in, I had heard the stories that they had had some struggles. It was my first time... Uh, managing sand base greens also mm -hmm. so I had a little trepidation about how they would hold up but mm -hmm. they held up beautifully um, what did I learn I th as far as out here we can give these things a shot of water uh, we we syringe by hand uh, in the afternoons okay uh, my, my theory is how we do I'll give them a couple minutes with the heads when we need them overheads and mm -hmm. we'll supplement that that's basically me I pull a hose on them every morning and get the greens prepped for the day a after the cut, you you do like the seal the cut move. So I'm, I'm not whether I get out there before the mower. It all it, it all depends on how the day goes. I don't. Yeah. It's yes. not too important to you. Correct. I'm going to put the heads on, and when I say put the heads on for us out there, I'll give them maybe three minutes, maybe four minutes in the morning. With right. They're two minute. It takes two minutes for the heads to rotate. Mm -hmm. So it'll get a two minute cycle, four minute cycle, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come out and hit the hot spots by hand. Mm -hmm. uh, Learn them pretty quickly last year. So the one thing I don't want to do is I do like I, I want to maintain for playability. I want the place to be fast and firm. So we're just gonna not gonna overwater anything to get a spot that may need a little bit more. I want to do that by hand, a mound or a hot spot. Um, and then yeah, once the greens let us know that they need a little bit of help in the afternoon, we'll go out and hit them by hand. Uh, how many how many guys are doing that? How many guys are pulling hose? So pulling hose on the greens is going to be myself and two other gentlemen on the crew. So okay. I, the importance of that task uh you know you can really go backwards if you don't have qualified people out there or someone that's going to miss a green i just have zero tolerance for that so we take it easy in the off season but when it's going to be you know i'm old school that way when you got the 100 days of hell in the middle of the summer mm -hmm. we're out there when we need to be out there the golf course tells us when it's ready to go home mm -hmm. but you asked me one thing i learned which is i think how we got down this road a little bit being the sand base greens um i'd give them you know, mid-season, I learned to give them a heavy syringe. For me, a heavy syringe means we're putting the nozzle of the hose down and putting the babies to bed for, you know, for the day, mm -hmm. 4 o'clock, whatever it may be. Sure. Because they're sand-based, we come back in the next morning, they're nice and firm. So they make it through the afternoon. You have and a good surface the next day. And you have a great surface in the morning. Okay. Correct. Correct. Um, and, and you learned that you can do that. Correct. It, they can take it. Spot. I was maintaining 100% poet annua greens that were more on push ups. Oh, yeah. Yes, exactly. So that strategy would not work. You don't want to give them a really big shot at the end of the day. You know? This w this was at the the par three or at Manny's. This was at manufacturers. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So it was a different strategy. Completely. Completely different turf. Uh, reacted 100% different soil greens. You definitely the. We battled them being too wet, if anything. It's actually during my tenure there, we installed XGD drainage to help to get the greens to perform a little bit better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you would never put them, you would never do like a kind of heavy syringe at 4 p.m. and then leave? No, no, you just, you'd get them through the day. I don't want to say keep them on life, life support, but that's what you're doing. That is what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. you give them too much, then they're, they're just going to be too wet. Then they're going to puke, and, and they might well melt out. Like, they, you know, the Poet Greens, they might, you, you could go too wet and you can't catch a humid night or, Exactly. A humid next morning, and a you could humid, have a humid stretch. A yeah, a humid over stretch. Seventy percent humidity, and Ooh, now you're in trouble. Look out! Yeah, look out. Good point. Disease out here was was it an issue? No, it wasn't. We battled dollar spot a little bit, and that's partially my fault. With uh, it, it, 
it popped up a little bit in the fall and mm-hmm. it was probably the product that i used was not the best we were trying to battle earthworms at the same time and i probably should have put something else in the tank so we yeah. had to do a little bit of uh unforeseen an unforeseen lead application because the dollar spot was active and the one thing that we do battle a little bit out here is take all patch now okay uh predominantly bent not predominantly the fairways are completely bent sure um, most people say that goes away as turf matures, mm-hmm. but that was also, we had a little bit in the approaches last year. That was more learning the irrigation system because we have uh, the irrigation system on the greens is a little bit strange. There's five heads on every green, oh, one of which is in the approach. So that was, again, probably my fault, not watering the product in enough in the spring last year. So it popped its head a little bit. We noticed it close or noticed it very early and put what, a curative vep out. Was that something that would have come on even in that that really hot, dry time? So no, that's more of a – you're going to notice it in the spring. Okay, so got it. Even I see a little bit possibly popping up on the approach of my eighth hole out there. And um, we did a little – just a, put a little bit in the tank just to take care of that and nip it in the bud. Mm-hmm. It's the only – yeah, so disease-wise, that's really all that we battled last year. Besides mm-hmm. that, pretty clean. Now, uh, to get back to the, the 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 watering practice and how you were surprised that the, the how well that these greens could take the the extreme abuse or the extreme temperatures and drought, you you talk a lot about your soil sprays. Like, is that it, what what's the strategies there? Uh, and did that kind of play into the the whole the whole system? I am a big proponent of feeding the soil. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I want to get my growing medium as how can I say biologically active and as healthy as possible. I think the more that you do that way, the more that you are okay. Above the surface. Can you see changes? Did you see, can you see changes from the time you got here? Can you see kind of, or do you have a gauge as to like uh, looking at at root systems, like maybe the color, the humifying? Are you, what, how can you gauge kind of improvement in that regard? I'm going to say turf quality. Okay. Turf quality. The membership has been extremely happy with the conditions that we've been able to present out there. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I, I switch products, as we talked about on our little drive around. I'm a right. big believer in Earthworks products. Well, mm-hmm. we switch it out with a couple other things, and I like to get a soil spray out there just about weekly. Um, yeah, so often, probably more often than, than most. More often at a lower rate. So Got it. Pretty much below label, whatever your low sure. label rate is. But guess what? I'm throwing a few more different products in there, and we're doing it more often. Yeah. So that will be, um, you know, if you talk, that we'll put that out, and that will be our deep infrequent irrigation that we might give so i may order that in for i said we do two minute increments i may throw them on for eight minutes if i spray that on a monday right and then we let it go yeah yeah and yeah what can i see results wise certainly root structure root length and turf quality it's turf quality and and how far you can push those greens into playing the way you want them to hard and fast yes and still being able to recover like not not pushing them over the edge yeah yeah i mean we've again um the the staff that i have here are not used to my were not used to my watering practices last year and pulling hose but you know when you miss a spot there's no telling the next day uh, now do you use a moisture meter we do we use a pogo just because it was here before i've used tdrs in the past mm-hmm. um you know I, I i think they're a wonderful wonderful tool especially when teaching new people in the industry maybe a new assistant, uh, right. what those numbers are. I can tell you, I mean, honest to God, I can tell you what that number is going to be, what your volumetric water content is going to be by just walking on a green visually saying it. I'll, oh, that's I'll, get, so it, cool, I'll get it within 5%, 99% of the time. So what are those numbers here? What's what's good? What do you, like, when do you know that you need to do more of the heavier watering? What do you, So uh, even when it comes to those numbers, I think that really depends on your environmental conditions. If okay. I have something that is at, you know, 15%, uh, volumetric water content, but I know I've got a cloudy afternoon where I'm not going to have to worry about it. We can let it go. Mm-hmm. But uh, on the other hand, if I know we got full sun, low humidity, high winds, then we got to get after it. The 15% is way too low at that correct, point. Correct, correct. Yeah. And I'm not managing for a number. It's basically we may give them a little bit more when we know we have those conditions. So spend a little bit more time on it by hand. Do we have a visitor? Yeah, it's all good. Okay, very good. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> no sweat. <laughs> um so okay yeah it really depends on what the type of day is correct correct 
you, you can't just you can't just go by the number, which is again where you're back to on the feel. Like you could call it. Yeah, I you know I know people or somebody at a public course, not a public course, I should say. One of my buddies who manages a public course needs sure. to get it to a certain number because right. they're not able to syringe. They know if they get it there, they're going to be good throughout the day. With the I don't want to say lack of play, but little play out there, right? I can get around green to green, pull a hose, and get it to where we need to be. So I want to keep it as dry as possible, but keep it alive for the next day. So the playability is there, hopefully 100% of the time for the membership. Now, yeah, and that and that makes it fun to, that makes it fun as a greenkeeper too. It's not fun to like be stressed about keeping golf or the golf course alive when you're getting 40,000 rounds mm -hmm. and you're bouncing with a hose in between golf and everything. That's yeah. difficult. So um, how old is Bellwood? Bellwood, we're actually in our 20, this is our 25th anniversary this year. Okay, excellent. So 98? 98. When um, it was constructed. Uh, and and speaking of construction, you think there was some like architecture changes or uh, over here that the, because you're you're on both sides of the road. There's five holes on the other side of the road. Correct. So we have a link style front nine, a more of a Parkland style back nine. Mm -hmm. And this is a, you know I don't know the full story with this. I know uh, Tom Fazio was involved with the project originally. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure the first 12 holes are Fazio, and then something happened. I don't know the story behind that, whether it was a financial thing or what have you. Who knows? But the holes uh, 13 through 17 on the other side of the road, are they're, they're drastically different than the holes that we have on the main side of the road. So the course is attributed to a gentleman by the name of Tom Drawshack, uh, when you look up who the architect of the golf course was. Cool. But I think it's more of a Fazio course, especially on the link style front nine, which is the nine that I appreciate a heck of a lot more. Yeah, and it's the majority of the golf course. It's where the clubhouse is. It's where your shop is. It's um, Correct. Um, it's where the eagles are. Correct. Uh, let's talk about where we're sitting right now. This clubhouse is absolutely exquisite. Yeah, yeah. It's really, it's really a beautiful building. Now, there's a history to this. There is. I don't know the most about it, just like I don't know the most about the architecture, but I believe it was called the Gruber Estate before, so it was an estate. Uh -huh. That was purchased by, um, so we were a partnership. Okay. Um, we're owned right now by the Piazza Auto Group. So Mr. Piazza was basically the, Mr. Piazza and Mr. Tornetta were the two original owners of the club. Now it's just owned by the Piazza. So Mike Piazza, professional baseball player, is one of the five brothers who is really my boss. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So he's only been, since I've been here on property one time, and um, you know, are they from Philadelphia? Is that are I they believe they're from Norristown? Oh, and okay. Now I think the majority of the family lives in the Phoenixville area. Wow, I'm cool. pretty sure. Yeah, I never knew. I never knew that Mike Piazza was from PA. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So no, I, I, and it's just at least as far as me and working at private clubs, not my whole life, but being involved with private clubs, we have a very good structure from my viewpoint. So I work under a general manager. We mm -hmm. don't have greens committees at all. Um, it's pretty nice. Yeah, and the conditions on the golf course are so that I don't really have to answer to too much. Uh, right. The membership is just over the moon for what we're able to present out there. So oh, that's so exciting, yeah. man. It's yeah. it's it, it must be fun to come to work. It is. It is. Drives yeah. a little bit much, but no, no. It's, it's a blast coming here. So you saw my dog, Nora, in there. Yeah. Uh, she's with me every single day, and I do. I, a lot of times drive around saying, thinking about how lucky I am to be able to come be with the pup, you know, just – have fun, do f physical work, and be able to present something like we present right. out there on the other side of this building. Yeah, and at the same time, you all you get to golf. You're a, you're a golf enthusiast. You're a golfer. You're a member. Right. You're a member at Huntington. You kind of really you, you've got a nice situation that yeah. you get to like you you get to appreciate this from the other side as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Really I've I've, <laughs> I've learned a lot about uh, the way clubs work, the way memberships perceive the way the property is or the way the club is or superintendent searches just to bring something up. You know, you, you, you learn a lot. I've got a very unique perspective from you the really other do. side, from the membership side. Yeah, you really do. It's a, how long have you been a member there? So I've been at Huntington Valley nearly 15 years. I joined in 2010. So Good for you. yeah, we're in our 14th season over there. Oh, that's great, man. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a blast. So 99% of my social time is spent over there at the club and it's, 
just a, about a two minute ride from my house. Yeah, so, I I asked you uh, coming in here if how how your golf season was going, if you've had any good rounds. Yeah. And you you filled me in that you were like, well, I'm getting started, things are going okay, but for me, like to have a great round. I've got to have my life. Life's got to be right. Like we, we it, use the word Zen. You yes. got to be Zen place. Yeah. You got to get Zen, uh, which is really nice. You said, and you said you had one of those this spring. I was very lucky. I did. A, I had an okay round this spring. Okay. Great. Completely unexpected. But uh, yeah, yeah. I won, a, I won a couple dollars that day. Yeah. Oh yeah. Nice to hear. And you, and you said like, I was able, you know, work was good, got everything accomplished. Uh, you know, you said, uh, like laundry was done, yeah. like looking fresh, ready to go. Got a pre cocktail in before the round. That always helps. That always helps. I asked you, I asked you, what is the ideal, ideal pre cocktail? You said, what did you say? So for me, I'm, I'm going to do a vodka club with a slice of orange. You know, nice and fresh. Maybe a double, but it gets you in a much better mood. Yes. Hitting that first T-shirt. And it doesn't weigh you down. No. Yeah. No. I told you I am the strictly Guinness drinker. Understood. I'm, that's a very fine product, one I have consumed many a time. <laughs> <laughs> yep, me too. Yeah. 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 yeah, it does you right. It does you right. Mm -hmm. um, well, Tim, this was an excellent talk. Uh, I think we uh, we got a real cool perspective here. Learned a lot about Bellwood. Learned a lot about yourself and uh, kind of some interesting management practices. And um, certainly got some cool uh, info about the the mating pair of the bald eagles here. Correct. Which I find what I find so cool is that it's been so long. Like the longevity of them coming year after year, ten years. Ten years. Yeah. So the tree unfortunately began to have a little bit of a lean to it. So we're hoping that the tree makes it. Um, you, you talked about uh, like uh, like you reached out for to a foundation. I applied for a grant just last week. So All hopefully right. they're going to come on in. Hopefully the tree makes it to the fall. We get approved for the grant. And um, yeah, the Fairways Foundation will pay for a company to cable the tree. It's called guying a tree and get it back to where it should be. And because, then, yeah, just to reiterate, it's the same tree, the same nest. Yes. Like the, the, they build a house and it stays there. Yeah. They, they do the maintenance on it. Like you said, you see them come through with some new bedding, maybe a new stick, a new this, but. I saw it this morning. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's very, it's exciting to come in every morning and witness that. Anybody same. that's listening, uh, maybe you can check out on YouTube uh, this this podcast because we'll hopefully have a couple of pictures of the bald eagles. I will share them with you. Excellent, excellent. Send them out with the email as well. All right, great. Yeah, Tim, thank you so Do much. We have two minutes to bring up the. Uh, oh Super my Scratch gosh, Foundation. we for, no, dude. I wish we fit it in earlier, but no. Yeah, we absolutely we have plenty of time to talk about the Super Scratch. So one other thing I'm extremely passionate about is we have hosted a tournament uh, at Huntington Valley. We we um, founded a nonprofit. Yes. The name we, we wish we chose a different name, but it is the Super Scratch Foundation. Well, so. I love the name. I, I I love the name Super Scratch. You can just you can explain it to everyone. So two th well, let's see, 2018. When was the first year of COVID? Was it 2018? Yeah, we're in our no 20 2020. Man, again, it's all right. The years, the dates doesn't make a difference. Yeah. But we're going to host our fourth tournament this year. But yes. we used to have a national amateur tournament that fell out of favor at Huntington Valley. A bunch of the better players at the club wanted to bring some sort of national style tournament back. Okay. To garner support for the membership with Scott Anderson's 40 year tenure there, you know, we threw the idea up of why don't we have a, a, sup a superintendent get paired with a scratch player? So there's thousands of pro ams, but we had never heard of anyone of anywhere where an amateur plays with the superintendent. It's so, so cool and because Scott's an avid golfer as well. He is. He yeah. is. I play with him quite a bit. But uh, yeah, we started out first year uh, right in the middle of the pandemic. We had mm -hmm. 12 teams and we were able to donate $1,500 to a student at Penn State. In three short years, that number's gone up to $15,000 that we were able to donate last oh year. Oh my gosh. The support from the industry and certainly from Earthworks, we thank you for supporting the tournament, has been humbling. I don't, not surprising, but it's just been um, more than we could have expected. We're making this a national tournament. This year, um, we are, we've got like 20 teams committed and teams from across the country. So I know Chicago Golf Club is committed. I know Congressional is committed. Chevy Chase, we've got some clubs up in New England. Um, we've got a couple out from California. 
either way, we have a goal. Of oh, you, you mentioned some of the Long Island golf courses too, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And again, I was trying to find that email and everything before we got started, but spraying rough this morning. That's I didn't so have good. enough time. I didn't leave myself enough prep time. But but you got the pre-emerge down. Correct. Yeah, so Correct. that's good. Yes. But um, we have a goal of giving $50,000 away this year. 50, 50 grand. And we just sent out our... Uh, emails last week asking for sponsors and asking for help and the support just in the first week has just been shocking it's been humbling how does the format go um isn't it like the alumni of the win the winning group where they went to college or so the way we have it is there's two competitions that take place there's an amateur tournament for the scratch player Mm -hmm. and then there is also a better ball tournament between the superintendent and that amateur Okay. So depending on where the superintendent, depending on where the team finishes, they get to choose what institution that they would like the money to go to. Uh, so the first couple of years, it was Del Val and Penn State, mm-hmm. um, our champion in 2022. Again, I, there was a gentleman from Marion. I apologize about not remembering everybody's okay. name, but he went to Rutgers. So Rutgers got a $5,000 scholarship. Um, so we now have a, relationship with Rutgers Mm -hmm. Um, yeah it's just everything's moving in the right direction and we're so excited about the future of this event and what we're going to be able to do to help future turf managers of America yeah and 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 also it's hosted at a premier golf course in in southeast Pennsylvania classic golf and if this thing really takes off we're gonna we have talked about having sites across the country as sort of qualifiers and maybe moving it around a little bit but uh yeah yeah I think we've I think we've got something good here and yeah. we're really looking to expand. Yeah, and and the format, the the setup with the superintendent and the scratch golfer, so cool. Like such a unique idea that really ties it all together. I, I think it's like the whole theme of of this podcast, too. Mm-hmm. Like the perspective of both the scratch golfer and the superintendent together. You know, mm-hmm. with, which is your unique perspective. This is uh, this has been a really cool conversation. Oh, good, I appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you so much, and and. And thank you for getting that comment in about uh, the story about the uh, Super Scratch. My pleasure. Yeah. All right. Good deal, Tim. Thanks so much. Jax, thank you for having me. Oh, you got it. Mm